Hello, hello, everybody. It's Trevon Donson here, live. This is my personal radio selection by Alan Watts. Today's broadcast is from the live recording of Myth of Myself and is presented by alanwatts.org. As we study man or any other living organism and try and describe him accurately and scientifically, we find that our normal sensation of ourselves as isolated egos inside a bag of skin is a hallucination. It really is. It's absolutely nutty. Because when you describe human behavior, or the behavior of a mouse or a rat or a chicken or anything you want to describe, you find that as you try to describe its behavior accurately, you must also describe the behavior of its environment. Supposing I walk and you want to describe the action of walking. You can't talk about my walking without also describing the floor. Because if you don't describe the floor and the space in which I am moving, all you will be describing is somebody swinging his legs in empty space. So as to describe my walking, you must describe the space in which you find me. You know, you couldn't see me unless you could also see my background, what stands behind me. See, if I myself, if the boundaries of my skin were coterminous with your whole field of vision, you wouldn't see me at all. You would see my bright red vest instead. That's why I put it on this evening to demonstrate this point. And that would be the thing that filled your field of vision, that that was the thing standing there. You wouldn't see me because in order to see me, you have to see not only what is inside the boundary of my skin, but you have to see what is outside it too. Now that's terribly important. Really, the fundamental, ultimate mystery, the only thing you need to know to understand the deepest metaphysical secrets, is this. That for every outside, there is an inside, and for every inside, there is an outside. And although they are different, they go together. There is, in other words, a secret conspiracy between all insides and all outsides, and the conspiracy is this, to look as different as possible, and yet underneath to be identical because you don't find one without the other. Like Tweedledum and Tweedledee agreed to have a battle. Note that, agreed. So there is a secret. What is esoteric, what is profound and what is deep is what we will call the implicit. What is obvious and on the open is what we will call the explicit. And I and my environment, you and your environment, are explicitly as different as different could be. But implicitly, you go together. And this is discovered by the scientist when he tries, as the whole art of science is to describe what happens exactly. And when he describes exactly what you do, he finds out that you... Your behavior is not something that can be separated from the behavior of the world around you. He realizes then that you are something that the whole world is doing. Just as when the sea has waves on it, all right, the sea, the ocean is waving. And so each one of us is a waving of the whole cosmos, the entire works, all there is. And with each one of us, it's waving and saying, Yoo-hoo! here I am. <coughs> Only it does it differently each time. Because variety is the spice of life. But you see, the funny thing is, 
we haven't been brought up to feel that way. Instead of feeling that we, each one of us, are something that the whole realm of being is doing, we feel that we are something that has come into the whole realm of being as a stranger. When we were born, we don't really know where we came from because we don't remember. And we think when we die, that's just going to be that. Some people console themselves with the idea that they're going to heaven or that they're going to be reincarnated or they're going to summer land or something, you know. <coughs> people don't really believe that. <coughs> no, for, for, for most people it's plausible. The real thing that haunts them is that when they die, they're going to sleep and never going to wake up. They're going to be locked up in the safe deposit box of darkness forever. But that all depends, you see, upon a false notion of what is oneself. Now the reason why we have this false notion of ourselves is, as far as I can understand it, that we have specialized in one particular kind of consciousness. Being very general and rough, we have two kinds of consciousness. One I will call the spotlight and the other the floodlight. The spotlight is what we call conscious attention. And that is trained into us from childhood as the most valuable form of consciousness. When the teacher in class says, pay attention, everybody stares and looks fast at the teacher like that. That's spotlight consciousness. Fixing your mind on one thing at a time. Concentrate. And even though you may not be able to have a very long attention span, nevertheless you concentrate. You use your spotlight one thing after another, one thing after another. Flip, 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 like that. But we also have another kind of consciousness, which I'll call the floodlight. For example, you can drive your car for several miles with a friend sitting next to you, and your spotlight consciousness will be completely absorbed in talking to your friend. Nevertheless, your floodlight consciousness will manage the driving of the car, will notice all the stoplights, the other idiots on the road, and so on, and you'll get there safely, without even thinking about it. <coughs> but our culture has taught us to specialize in spotlight consciousness and to identify ourselves with that form of consciousness alone. I am my spotlight consciousness. My conscious attention, that is my ego, that is me. And very largely we ignore the floodlight. Now the floodlight consciousness is working all the time. Every nerve end that we have is its instrument. You know you can go out to luncheon or something and you sit next to Mrs. So-and-so and you go home and your wife says to you, was Mrs. So-and-so there? Yes, I sat next to her. Well, what was she wearing? I have the faintest idea. You saw, but you didn't notice. Now, because we have been brought up to identify ourselves with the spotlight consciousness, and the floodlight consciousness is undervalued, we have the sensation of ourselves as being just the spotlight. Just the ego that looks and attends to this and that and the other. And so we ignore and are unaware of the vast, vast extent of our being. People who by various methods become fully aware of their floodlight consciousness have what is called a mystical experience or a cosmic consciousness or what the Buddhists call Bodhi, awakening. The Hindus call Moksha, liberation. Because they discover that the real deep, deep self that which you really are, fundamentally and forever, 
is the whole of being. All that there is, the works, that's you. Only that universal self that is you has the capacity to focus itself at ever so many different here and nows. So when you use the word I, this, as William James said, is really a word of position like this or here. Just as a sun or star has many rays, so the whole cosmos expresses itself in you, in you, in you, in you, in you, with all the different variations. It plays games. It plays the John Doe game, the Mary Smith game. It plays the beetle game, the butterfly game, the bird game, the pigeon game, the fish game, the star game. Just like uh, these are games that differ from each other, just like backgammon, whist, bridge, uh, poker, pinochle, or like waltz, mazurka, uh, minuet, and so on. It dances with infinite variety. But every single dance that it does, that is to say, you is what the whole thing is doing. But you see, we forget it. We don't know. We, we, we've been brought up in a special way so that we are unaware of the connection. Unaware that each one of us is the, is the works. Playing it this way for a while. And so we have been taught to dread death as if that were the end of the show. It won't happen anymore. And therefore to be afraid of all the things that might bring about death, pain, sickness, suffering. And if you don't know, you see, if you're not really vividly aware of the fact that you are basically the works, you have no real joy in life. You're just a bundle of anxiety mixed up with guilt. <coughs> because, you see, when we bring children into the world, we play awful games with them. Instead of saying, how do you do? Welcome to the human race. Now, my dear, we are playing some very complicated games. And these are the rules of the game we play. I want you to understand them, and then you learn them, and then when you get a little bit older, you may be able to think up some better rules. Instead of being quite direct with our children, instead we say, you're here on probation, you understand that? And maybe when you grow up a bit you'll be acceptable. <laughs> but until then, you should be seen and not heard. You're, uh, you're a mess. <laughs> and you've got to be educated and schooled and whipped until you're human. <laughs> so that these attitudes which are inculcated into us in infancy go on into old age the way you start out is liable to be the way you finish so people going around fundamentally feeling that they don't belong because their parents said to them in the first place look you don't really belong here you're here on sufferance you're on probation you're not a human being yet and people feel this right on into old age. And so they figure that the universe is presided over by this awful kind of God the Father parent, who yes, has our best interest at heart, is loving, but who spares the rod, spoils the child. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. <coughs> so everybody sort of, <laughs> when's it gonna hit next? <laughs> and so don't, feel that they belong. So we get this ghastly, what I call Christian ego. It's a little bit Jewish too. <laughs> <laughs> Who really feels that he doesn't, he's homeless, he does his orphan. 
Even the Christians say we are sons of God by adoption and grace. Not real sons, but by adoption and grace and sufferings. And uh, so comes the sensation. So characteristic of Western man and indeed of all highly civilized people. Of being a stranger in the earth. A momentary flash of consciousness between two eternal blacknesses. And so therefore we speak of confronting reality. Facing the facts. We speak of coming into this world. And this whole sensation that we are brought up to have of being an island of consciousness locked up in a bag of skin facing outside us a world that is profoundly alien to us in the sense that what is outside me is not me. This sets up a fundamental sensation of hostility and estrangement between ourselves and the so-called external world. So my main point last night was then that we need a new kind of consciousness in which every individual becomes aware that his real self is not just his conscious ego. You know Let's take a headlight of a car. The headlight shines on the road in front. The headlight does not shine on the wire which connects it with its own battery. So in a way, the headlight is unaware of how it shines. And in the same way, we are unaware of the sources of our consciousness. We don't know how we know. There was a young man who said, though, it seems that I know that I know. What I would like to see is the I that knows me when I know that I know that I know. (laughs) And so we are ignorant of, we ignore. It doesn't come within the scope of our attention how it is that we manage to be conscious. How it is that we manage to grow our hair, to shape our bones, to beat our heart, and to secrete all the necessary fluids that we need from our glands. We do it, but we don't know how we do it. Because, you see, underneath the superficial self, which pays attention to this and that, there is another self, more really us than I. And if you become aware of that unknown self, the more you become aware of it, the more you realize that it is inseparably connected with everything else that there is. That you are a function of this total galaxy bounded by the Milky Way and that furthermore this galaxy is a function of all other galaxies. And that vast thing that you see far off, far off, far off with telescopes and you look and look and look, one day you're going to wake up and say, Why, that's me. And in knowing that, know, you see, that you never die. That you are the eternal thing that comes and goes, that appears now as John Jones, now as Mary Smith, now as Betty Brown, so it goes forever, ever, ever. Listening to The Love of Wisdom with Alan Watts. The Love of Wisdom with Alan Watts is produced by the Electronic University. Our theme music is by Acoustic Alchemy. I'm Neil Harvey. Thank you for listening. Most of us are brought up to feel that what we see out in front of us is something that is that lies beyond our eyes out here that the colors and the shapes that you see 
in this room are out there. Now, in fact, that is not so. In fact, all that you see is a state of affairs inside your head. All these colors, all these lights are conditions of the optical nervous system. There are, outside the eyes, quanta electronic phenomena, vibrations. But these things are not light. They are not color until they are translated into states of the human nervous system. So if you want to know how the inside of your head feels, open your eyes and look. That is how the inside of your head feels. But we are normally unaware of that and project it out.